So after the over the past week or so, there's been a number of students that have asked me to come over to the Sectra table and to walk them through their radiology section, and it seems to have been pretty helpful to people. Um, the obvious problem and limitation with the Sectra table is that you can only get so many people around it. So uh, I thought the other day that perhaps it might be worthwhile to basically call up a Radiant program on my home computer and do a little bit of a recording to walk people through um, basic radiology and a couple things to keep in mind with this um, number one I'm not a trained radiologist so as I walk through I'm not sure if this is naturally the best way to do it but I'm just going to give you some ideas on the things that I look for in being able to identify the normal anatomical structures in radiography compared to what you see on a gross anatomical perspective um, something else to keep in mind is that we will be using the Radiant program for this. I know the recommendation for everyone was to um, use Mango. These are both free software programs. Um, the big advantage of Mango is that it's uh, got a platform for both Windows and for Mac. And so that's why we went with that uh, recommendation for the class. But um, if you do have a PC, I just find Radiant to be much more user friendly. And if you were to Google R-A-D-I-A-N-T, DICOM, Radiant DICOM. Um, it takes seconds to install. Um, just activate it using a trial license, but you can keep renewing that trial license over and over again, so you never actually have to uh, make a purchase of it. So using the Radiant, which is also the program that we have on the sector table right now, um, I've called up just a standard image. This happens to be 16366, but it was more of an arbitrary choice. The nice thing about it is it does give me pretty much everything I need to assess, including the arm and the hand, which a number of the scans, um, they fall out of the line of sight of the table, and so you um, lose some of that information. So we'll be able to look at quite a bit as we go through here. And in doing it, I'll be jumping back and forth from the normal plain film radiograph that we're seeing here um, to the CT scans to give you a decent perspective on what you're looking at. I'll also be talking about some of the functionality with Radiant and describing the keys that I'm pressing to be able to get this to work the, properly the way it's supposed to. So here we're just seeing the general overall radiographic view. Um, this gives us a chance to sort of see if there's anything of um, significance with this individual. If I press the um, M button and then click on the mouse and pull down, that allows me to move into a certain plane. And I'm doing it now so that I can click Z. Once again, holding down the um, left button on the mouse, that allows me to zoom in and out a bit more. So a couple of things to notice, and this will be important as we go through the axial uh, CT images, is that as with a lot of these cadavers, the um, arm gets pushed up a little bit. So you can see there's a bit of an elevation to the clavicle, which means as we move down the path, we're going to see the acromioclavicular joint first, and then we'll kind of see how the clavicle moves in uh, to the level of the sternum. And in looking at this, there's not too much um, abnormalities that we can see. Um, we can see a little bit of the what should be the aorta and some calcification and we'll notice that uh, most of the way down with this individual as we go through uh, especially when we get into the femoral artery uh, you can very distinctly see the uh, femoral artery because of the calcifications which is actually quite handy for what we're going to be looking at so the next thing that we want to do is to take a look at some of the CT data. We'll start with an axial view, and when you open up the axial view over here, it always starts at the uh, top of the head. So we're gonna scan through this fairly quickly. Um, obviously, we haven't studied the brain tissue yet. We'll get back to that. Interestingly, when we do get to brain extraction um, with this particular brain, I am noticing these are the um, left and right ventricles, or the first and second ventricles that are found within the brain, and we do get significant enlargement here, so um, it looks like we'll have some brain pathology, it looks like some deterioration, hydrocephaly, that sort of thing, so just something to keep in mind for that group when we do get to opening this uh, cranial cavity up. Um, you can see the bridge of the nose and the eyes, just to kind of give you perspective here. And then we go through to the 
base of the brain. Um, so can't really get too many of the foramen of the skull. We just don't have that much definition, which would be helpful for the dental students at this point, but that's not going to be a big focus until later on. We get to the bottom, though, and this is basically at the level of the foramen magnum, a little bit below that. So once again, I'm going to zoom in on this and move over to the center. And what we're actually looking at here is the anterior arch of C1. And right in the middle here, we can see the dens. So this is the, the perspective of things. As you think about what the normal anatomy looks like in this area, and you try and look for structures, um, these landmark structures. And that's what we're seeing here. And then this would be the transverse band of the uh, cruciform ligament that holds things in place. We've got the spinal cord slash, uh, slash brainstem showing within the middle here, and uh, a bit of an enlargement of the space as well, as well as the posterior aspect of the occiput and a bit of the cerebellum by the looks of it here. Move our way a little bit further down. So as we go down, you can see more of the dens showing up, a bit more of that transverse ligament. And now we're seeing the posterior arch of C1. And a bit further yet, that's going to take us into C2. And you see we get a little bit of rotation, and um, that's going to relate to some pathology that we'll talk about in just a second related to the cervical vertebrae for this individual. Again, the spinal cord. You can see the subarachnoid space shown in black because it's fluid filled. And then this would be the epidural space on the outside, which is a bit darker because of the fat filled space. Something else that you can see as I scroll up and down and to give you perspective on things, if you look at the, the cursor here on the side, that'll tell you as I'm moving up and down in this, but you can start to see some of the posterior neck musculature um, as well. So we're gonna have the um, splenius and semispinalis capitis out here as well as the trapezius a bit further up. Moving a bit further down, you can see we're in the cervical region so you can see the foramen transversarium and you'd have the vertebral artery within that space. And as we go further down still, this should get us into the intervertebral foramen where we would have the spinal nerves exiting. Um, body of the uh, cervical vertebrae here, um, showing some pathology, um, showing some deterioration. So this is an older individual. And same sort of thing on the side here. As we're going through the cervical region, we're actually going to see a lot of calcification of cartilaginous structures and um, a lot of uh, pathology to the bone tissue here that I observed a little bit further. And again, you can find the um, deep intrinsic back musculature, your transversal spinalis, your uh, splenius muscles, and then these lines would be the um, fascial planes that are separating the individual muscles. As for identifying the individual muscles, uh, a bit beyond what you need to do for this course. So we're starting to get into the shoulder area here, but I'm just going to take a second to flip over to a slightly different view so what I'm going to do here is use the 3D button that we see at the top, and this is going to give us a 3D reconstruction of the DICOM stack. So here we are in the 3D reconstruction. I've already removed the um, back portion of the bed that the cadaver was lying on and uh, zoomed in so that this gives us more of a, a sagittal view of the cervical vertebrae. And what you can notice is that there is a lot of cervical deterioration here. Um, you can see calcification of um, what should be the thyroid cartilage area if there's a hyoid bone. But then you can also see that we have disc slippage in this area as well. So one of the other things that I can do um, is to actually take out most of the mandible to give you a better view. So here it is with the mandible taken away, and you can see using this view the irregularity within the cervical vertebrae and the pathology that we're seeing within these um, vertebral bodies and the amount of calcification. So uh, we didn't get the clearest view um, using this cadaver, and you can appreciate why because of the amount of pathology that we have here. 
So let's switch back to our CT view and continue to work our way down. So we can see the spinous process of the vertebrae, that bifurcation, the bifid process that we see in the cervical region. And we're also starting to see a little bit of the shoulder um, pop in at this view as well. And what you'll notice is we're seeing more of the shoulder. Um, remember, we're looking for the feet up. So the shoulder on the right side comes into view a little bit before the left. And again, jumping to the 3D view, that makes sense because where the um, uh, cadaver was positioned on the table, it was um, not completely straight. So that's important to recognize as you go through. If you're seeing one thing on one side and something completely different on the other side, it doesn't mean that there is an anomaly with the individual. It's just the way that the body's positioned. And that's why it's important to be able to scroll up and down through the CT to be able to get a full perspective. Okay, so we make our way down. And what you start to notice over on this side, there we go. So we start to see the form of the acromion process and the clavicle here. So the spot in between is going to be the acromioclavicular point. This is the furthest and most superior point out on the shoulder, um, which means that we also have a bit of the deltoid muscular tissue showing on the outside as well. And now as I scan through, what you're gonna see is that the acromion is going to lead into the spine of the scapula back here. And the clavicle is going to start moving um, medially as we go through and this is going to meet up with the sternum and it's going to form your sternoclavicular joint with the manubrium as well and then we have the first rib starting to appear underneath that so moving back up a little bit let's trace a bit more on what's happening to the shoulder so here's our acromion it's moving back into the spine. And at this level, we start to see the humeral head come into play. This would be the coracoid process a little bit further up. So just to give you perspective, we're basically at this horizontal level where we can see the humeral head and the coracoid process. I'm gonna keep jumping back and forth to this image just to give you a perspective of where you actually are in the body at this point in time. We move down a little bit and we can see the head of the humerus articulating with the glenoid fossa. So that would be the proper shoulder joint. You can see the indentation here, which would be the bicipital groove and the soft tissue structure of the biceps brachii long head tendon showing in this spot as well. Um, and we can see the continuation of the scapula here. We have the spine in the back. This is the body. So going up a little bit in this perspective, um, this region here would be your supraspinatus muscle from an axial view and probably blending in with the infraspinatus muscle as they both wrap around to attach to the supraglenoid tubercle. And then as we move down from there a little bit, this would be your subscapularis muscle on this side more of the infraspinatus from the posterior side and eventually getting into the teres minor. Something else I can point out moving a bit more centrally in this case is we can start to see that we're in the thoracic vertebrae because we have our first uh, a couple of ribs. So here is a rib. We can see the head of the rib articulating with the facets on the body of the vertebrae. And then this would be the articulation between the tubercle of the rib and the transverse process of the vertebrae as well. Um, something very quickly just to show on the other side. So we go up here a little bit. And I noticed this when I went to the other image of the cadaver, that when you look at the left acromioclavicular joint, there seems to be more deterioration here. And that shows up on the CT where we have a bit more of a gap on this side than what we saw in the previous image. So more of the soft tissue perspective as well. You can see the erector spinae and transversal spinalis group in here. And you can see the clear outline of what would be the trapezius muscle on this side as well. One last thing of interest before we move out of this area, it's getting kind of into the pathology. So once again, we have the coracoid process 
and the glenoid fossa. And then as we move down into the actual body of the scapula, it's very subtle, but when you look at the body here, you're going to notice like little gap areas where it almost looks like there's no bone left, and that's because there isn't. So when we move to this view and we have a full perspective on the scapula, you can see these dark areas. And this is quite common in an elderly individual where the scapular body will completely deteriorate away. And you actually have fusion between subscapularis on the anterior side and the, uh, the infraspinatus on the posterior side as well. So just something to be aware of. So we're now going to make our way down the arm. And we'll be looking at the shaft of the humerus um, where it comes into the elbow into the forearm, and we will get a very small view of the wrist with this individual, not too much, but we'll be able to see a fair amount with this. Something to note, though, is that the individual's arm is pronated. So as we get into the forearm, you're going to be seeing a little bit of a switching up, and it's going to look a little different than what you would expect in anatomical position. So just something to be aware of as we move through. So here we are again on the individual's right arm. And we're going to scroll down. So here's the humeral head that we see here. We scroll down inferiorly, and that's going to take us into the humeral shaft, where we see very dark uh, colored, or sorry, lightly colored, bright compact bone, and a little bit of cancellous bone with the bone marrow in the middle here. Move down a little bit further, so we're into the um, mid-humeral or mid-brachial region. And you can pretty clearly see the anterior compartment here of musculature and the posterior compartment, which would be made up of the tricep. Everything on the outside here, that's going to be cutaneous tissue. It may look thick, so this is probably um, an individual with a bit more subcutaneous uh, tissue, a little bit more body fat, which is why we're seeing such a thickened area in that perspective. Move down a little bit further, and you can continue to see those compartments Probably can see the outline of the biceps brachii muscle and the brachialis. So we're in the lower level of the um, brachium. Just going to move this over a little bit so we can really focus on this area. Zoom in a little bit too. And continue our move down. And we can see the humerus broadening out. So we're probably getting into the epicondyles at this spot, which means very soon. Yeah, so it becomes darker because this is sort of the, the bridge over the bone. And what I mean by that, from this perspective, we have all of this um, spongy bone, but when we get to this spot, it creates a, a dome of compact bone, which we're hitting. So that's why the uh, intensity uh, becomes a lot more dense. And what we're going to start to see is the outline of the trochlea and the capitulum. And then we'll be able to see as we go through that the radial head will start to appear and we'll be able to see that articulation with the capitulum. So here we move in, scrolling inferiorly, and you can see the beginning of the olecranon process off the ulna that fits into the olecranon fossa. And in this view, we have the medial epicondyle, so this would be the start of the flexor muscle group coming off of that. You should be able to see the outline of the trochlea in this view that I'm basically surrounding with the cursor. And then the capitulum on the other side is starting to show up. As we go a bit further down, there's the lateral surface of the radius. Remember from this view that we have that we're basically at this level, so the radius is not sitting completely flat. It's at an oblique line. so. Um, we're just starting to see the outside, and as we can continue to roll down, we're going to see more and more of that radial head. So let's do that now as we continue down. That's the end of the capitulum. You can see the indentation in the middle of the radial head, and then we're getting a pretty full perspective of the radial head here. And that would be the radial notch on the ulna. Once again, the olecranon on here, um, the inferior most portion of the uh, humerus and the medial epicondyle of the humerus. And that would basically be the proximal radio ulnar joint where we get pronation supination occurring. And then as we continue further down, we get proper separation of the radius and ulna here. 
and we're going to start to see the interosseous membrane. This is going to be the anterior compartment, and this is going to be the posterior compartment. Just once again, remember that we have pronation, so the anterior compartment is actually going to be seen medially, and the posterior compartment is going to be seen uh, laterally in this specific perspective. So try not to let you throw that off. Try not to let that throw you off there. We continue down. You can see the ridge of bone on the medial and lateral surface. Up. So this is where you're going to see the interosseous membrane interconnecting these two bones. Again, anterior compartment, posterior compartment. Actually get a nice little view here of the interosseous membrane within this space. You can, it's, it's a little bit difficult to pick up on these soft tissue structures, but um, in this case, you can clearly definitively see that there is that line interconnecting those two bones. So we continue to move our way down. And this is where we're going to start to see it venture out to the side here. And it's going to make it more difficult to identify. But again, anterior compartment, this would be within the long flexor tendons, posterior compartment with the extensor tendons. And as it starts to scroll off the screen, we can see the end of the ulna here. And then this would take us into the terminal portion of the ulna and we're into the wrist region. But unfortunately, because we're so far out, the signal gets lost at that point. So we can't really do a good job with the carpal bones. This would be the uh, uh, metacarpals here, but um, uh, that's where we kind of lose our perspective. So let's bring this into the middle a bit more. And let's zoom back up and continue our view through the thoracic region. There we go. So once again, we're in the thoracic vertebrae where you can see the articulation with the ribs and the spinal cord surrounded by the subarachnoid space here. Um, not really talking about anything that's happening in the thorax or abdomen. Um, we'll have a later review session, which we'll discuss that. But as we go through, you can once again clearly see the, the ribs articulating with the head and the tubercles with the transverse processes as we move our way down here. We're into the abdomen. We can see the liver at this uh, point in time to give us some perspective on things. Here are the kidneys bilaterally. And so this takes us into the lumbar vertebrae. Get a nice view here of the transverse processes. And this is what we would typically see with the lumbar vertebrae where they're much smaller and then a very large, broad um, body uh, of the lumbar vertebrae. And this is kind of a neat view here because you can actually see the zygopophyseal joints. So this would be the inferior articulating facet of the one vertebrae and the superior articulating facet of the inferior vertebrae. And also notice that as we uh, look in the middle here, we're no longer seeing the spinal cord because this would be probably right around the level of L1, L2. And so there's the spinal cord. And now watch what happens. It disappears. So that's where it's at the level of the conus medullaris and phylum terminal. And now these little dots would each represent part of the cauda equina. So there's only a couple of them. Um, that's because we would have a lot more here, but it's just not strong enough a signal for them to really show up. Um, but the fact that we do get a couple of these um, tells us that we do have the um, cauda equina in this region. So we continue to move a bit further down. Let me expand this out a little bit. And as we do, the next thing of significance that we will see, well, first of all, once again, we have the transversal spinalis group, which would be in here. Erector spinae group a little bit further out to the side. Um, you would have the thoracolumbar fascia showing up here, leading into latissimus dorsi, which doesn't really show up too well. And then again, this is a um, individual with more subcutaneous tissue, so we have a lot of subcutaneous um, fat tissue on the outside as well. Next big thing of significance that you're seeing, these are the wings or the ala of the ilium. So we're right at the level of the pelvis. 
and we're going to start to see these come and fuse in, and we're going to see a transition into our sacrum here. There we go, perfect. So kind of make out the um, aspect of the sacrum. We have the sacroiliac joints that we can see, and you can see the roughened appearance because they are not uh, smooth articulations that prevents a lot of excessive unwanted movement. So we're now on the level here. You've got iliacus on the one side, psoas major over here, and then this would be the start of the gluteus maximus on either side. So the soft tissue showing up quite nicely. Move away down a little bit further, and we can see those anterior and posterior foramina on the sacrum. And then that's going to taper into our coccyx at this point, which means the next thing we should start to see very soon is the emergence of the femoral head. So to bring this back into perspective for you, we basically came, we hit the wings of the ala, or the, sorry, the ala of the ilium, and scrolled our way all the way down. And so we're basically at this level now where we're starting to see the femoral heads. And in a second, we will be able to also see the greater trochanter as well. So I come down, there's the start of the greater trochanter there that you can see. You can also see a little bit of the fovea capitis, the indentation where the ligament to the head of the femur, round ligament to the head of the femur is going to attach in. And scroll further down so we can see the fusion here between the, um, the greater trochanter and the head of the femur, which means if we look over on this side, we should see the beginning of the obturator foramen which means a little bit up here, when we see this spot where we have the greater trochanter, and you see this dense area, um, that means that there's a lot of cortical bone there, and that's typical of what you see at uh, processes where you have tendon insertion. So if you think about what inserts in this area, we're at the level of obturator internus. We can see the outline of obturator internus on the internal surface of the ilium, and ischium and give us the nominate bone. And then this would be the tendon coming from the outside and the attachment into that um, little niche within the greater trochanter. And as you scroll up and down, you might even be able to get a perspective of the superior and inferior gemelles as you go as well. So gives you some perspective of what we're looking at there. So there's the um, obturator foramen at this point. Um, which means on the outside, there's a muscle that you haven't really been able to see yet. That's going to be your obturator externus as well, more of the internus. It's a pretty large muscle, so as we scroll up and down, we're going to see um, different views of it. And then the internus on the inside. And this is going to start taking us into the shaft of the femur, at which point I probably should have said this a minute or two ago, but if you're a dental student, um, you don't really need the next part of it for the exam, although if you find this interesting, then by all means keep watching. So we're scrolling down a bit now, and that's taking us, so we see at this point that would be the lesser trochanter on the uh, femur, and so now this is taking us into the shaft, femoral shaft, the linea aspera is going to start to become prevalent on the outside here. Here's our anterior muscle group and our medial muscle group just starting, and then our posterior thigh muscles, so on, on the back side. Something else that's uh, interesting, which is going to be kind of neat for perspective here. Again, as I mentioned off the top, we have a lot of calcification within the femoral artery uh, in particular. And so this allows us to fairly easily trace this as we go through the CT image. And so that's what we're seeing right here. So keep an eye on that as we continue to scroll down through this perspective. You're going to see this start to migrate over a little bit. So as we scroll down, we're actually going to see this migrate over as it goes through the adductor hiatus into the posterior aspect of the leg, the popliteal fossa. Once again, you can see the linea aspera. You can see all of that anterior muscle group coming off. 
um, the medial muscle group over here and the posterior muscle group. In some individuals, not as much here, but you can see the um, vastus intermedius here. This would be the rectus femoris. Sometimes it shows up even uh, more distinctly as its uh, specific bulge. And again, note the migration of the femoral artery to the posterior side. So we're getting closer and closer to the margin of the popliteal fossa. So we can see a decrease in the size of the anterior muscle group, and we're starting to see the formation of the quadriceps tendon here. It becomes fairly thick and dense and does show up on radiographic, uh, on CT imaging. And now we also see the broadening of the femur at this point, which gives us the medial and lateral condyles. And there we have the formation of the patella. So we move a little bit further back. We have some activity out here. That would actually be either ossification or the tendon of the gastronemius muscle. A little bit, or, no, sorry, that's actually going to be, um, if you look for a second, here we have a left lateral view of the knee. So we're right at this level here where you can see that the um, condyle kind of pops up a little bit at the back. And so we have a little space here. And then we hit part of the back part of the condyle as well as the front part of the condyles as well, just to give you that perspective from here. Okay, so we continue to go down more into the condyles. You can see the patella. Um, in radiological view, they'll sometimes have the individual bend their leg and kind of take a special shot where you can see the uh, patella. It's uh, called sometimes either the sunrise view or the skyline view of the patella. And if you suspect that you have patellar tracking issues and uh, patella femoral syndrome, then this would be ind indicative. So obviously with this being a deceased individual and everything sort of flopping around, we can't make any diagnosis here. But if this was a living patient that was in a flex knee position, the fact that you have such contact between the lateral surface of the patella and the lateral condyle of the femur uh, would be indicative of patellofemoral syndrome. We move a little bit further down, and we start to see the condyles of the femur spread apart. Here we have the separation on this side, and so this is going to be at the level of the tibial plateau. So if you remember me saying from class, this would be the um, rise a little bit in the middle of the tibia on either side of the condyles here. And it would also represent the spot at which the ACL and PCL um, would be attached. We go a little bit further down, and that's going to start to show some meniscal tissue. Although given the age of the individual, I'm not sure how much of the meniscus is going to be back and visible. And now we're starting to see the tibial condyles, medial and lateral tibial condyles, which is taking us right at the uh, top part of the tibia. We go a bit further and it becomes darker as we get more into that spongy bone tissue. And then just a bit further down, we start to see the articulation with the head of the fibula here, which means as we continue to go further down, here we are into the lower leg region. Again, to keep things in perspective here, um, similar to what we saw at the forearms, note that in this individual, they're uh, somewhat uh, externally rotated in the left hip. And so consequently, when we look at the lower limb, um, the anterior compartment is going to actually be seen more laterally, and the posterior compartment is going to appear more medially. It's not going to be in proper anatomical position, which is uh, what you traditionally have learned. So moving down the leg, we can see the tibia here, and notice the density of the bone at the front. So that's that ridge of bone where we see the anchoring of the anterior portion of the crural fascia. So this would be the anterior compartment here with tibialis anterior, um, uh, extensor digitorum longus, and extensor hallucis longus. Remember the fibula, this would be the lateral compartment, and then the much larger posterior compartment expansion. Um, once again, with cutaneous fat tissue on the outside. Same sort of idea here, anterior compartment, lateral compartment here, 
and then posterior compartment in the back. And you can see somewhat of a distinction between the deep and superficial aspects of the posterior compartment as well. So that's all showing up quite nicely. A um, little interesting thing here. So this is the continuation of the popliteal artery. Um, and we're actually seeing, remember, this is calcified. It's got a lot of uh, calcification in the vasculature. And here we can actually see where it's splitting into the uh, posterior tibial and anterior tibial artery. So it gives you a perspective of exactly where that happens and the continuation of those. So this would be the anterior neurovascular bundle, the anterior tibial artery, uh, the deep fibular nerve, and then the posterior tibial artery and uh, tibial nerve in the back there. Uh, continues down. Speed this up a little bit. There's not too much else to talk about until we get down to this level here, where we see the tibia and fibula come back together. So this would be the distal uh, tibiofibular joint. So we would have the uh, ligamentous support here that, if torn, would result in the high ankle sprain that we talked about. And as we go down a little bit further, we can see these areas bulge into what will become the medial and lateral malleoli of the ankle, which means right here, a lot of density. So we're at the very bottom of the tibia where we have a lot of compact bone. And this will give way to our talus bone. So you can see the talus bone starting to pop in here into perspective, medial malleolus, lateral malleolus. To bring this into perspective, we're right at this level of um, the, um, uh, the CT image right now. So medial malleolus, uh, talus, and lateral malleolus on the other side. And we're going to see the same sort of thing happen on the other side as well, bottom of the tibia. And then there's the talus and the medial and lateral malleolus. Um, keeping on this side, we start to see the tuberosity of the calcaneus, calcaneal tuberosity coming in here. And notice at the back, we can see the very broad, distinct, let's move up again. So that is our Achilles tendon coming down bilaterally, so thick. Um, expansive collagen, so it does show up quite nicely in CT images. And this is where it inserts into the calcaneal tuberosity. We can see more of the body of the calcaneus articulating with the um, talus, so that's the talocalcaneal joint. And something else of interest as we move along, this is the sustentaculum tali of the calcaneus, so that is the uh, uh, shelf, the calcaneal shelf. And if we look just back here, we see this small little divot that I'm pointing out. That is the flexor hallucis longus tendon, which as we talked about, goes right underneath the cystentaculum tali. So if I move up again, we can see flexor hallucis longus, and we can also see on the other sides, uh, tibialis po posterior and flexor digitorum longus. So this gives us our Tom, Dick, artery vein nerve hairy flexor hallucis longus on this side. So we continue to move down further. Sustentaculum tali once again. This is the head of the navicular bone. We can see where it articulates with the calcaneus as well. Down further. And now, sorry, the talus. This is the tailor bone. That's the head of the tailor bone, um, the talus bone. And then we can see where the head of the talus is now starting to articulate with the navicular bone. So we talked about how it has a boat-shaped appearance. So there's the navicular bone. Um, should be fairly easy to discern. And then as we move a little bit further down, remember that because of the orientation of the feet, it's rather than you know, seeing them all at once flat, we're sort of moving down in this perspective of things. So this is where we get into our cuneiforms and our cuboidal bone. And you can see some of the um, musculature on the underside here. And then that's going to take us into our metatarsals. And finally, into our 
phalanges. And that's pretty much where that's going to end. Now, something else we can do if you're using the Radiant program is we have this um, black and white button here, multiplanar reconstructions, and it shows that we're in axial view, but the next thing that we can do is um, briefly go to a coronal view. I'm not going to take nearly as long on this as I did with the transaxial, but just a few things to point out here. So this would be towards the, the front of the body here. As we move in, um, you can start to see the lumbar vertebrae appear. So remember that because of the curvature of the spine, as we go from the front towards the back, the lumbar vertebrae are going to be seen first. And as we actually get into the vertebral canal, we're going to see it lower. And as we move further back, it looks like it's kind of migrating upwards. So that's because of the fact that the body, um, that the um, vertebral column is curved and angular. So um, as we span through, you have to keep this in mind to keep your perspective. So let's just zoom in here a little bit, um, pressing the Z button and then press M to move this down. So I'm scrolling from front to back now and you can see the uh, vertebral bodies giving way to the vertebral canal. A little bit of the cauda equina like we talked about um, into perspective there. There's the um, sacroiliac joint once again. So go through that, just going further up. Um, Moving back a little more anteriorly, there's the um, that's the hip joint, and you can see the ligament to the head of the femur. Let's zoom in on this for just a moment. Yeah, so this would be the ligament to the head of the femur, round ligament to the head of the femur, coming in at that angle there. Let's move down a bit. So once again, the vertebral canal, and we can trace that further up. And now we're starting to see aspects of the spinal cord in place because we're in the thoracic region of that now. Um, more of the ribs coming out to the side as well. Let's move further and further up. So this is the posterior arch, um, or sorry, the, the kyphotic region of the thorax. So that's as far back as the canal is going to go. And then if we scroll back more anteriorly, so we're going anterior again, we can see more of the vertebral canal in the cervical region here. And that also allows us at this point, if we go up far enough here, there's our sternoclavicular joint. And we can again try trace the clavicles out here. That would be the coracoid process from an anterior view. And there we are where we can see the acromioclavicular joint. Just going to zoom in on this area. So um, again, it's important to remember this is the perfectly anterior view based on the computer's rendition. Um, notice that we're not looking, that the scapula is not completely in a coronal plane. It's at a bit of an angular plane here. So as we go through this, we're going to see some aspects of it as if it was on the angle. So this is our chromion that will be going back into the spine region. Here we have the glenoid um, fossa and the head of the humerus once again. And what we're seeing here is the subacromial space. So you can actually make out the supraspinatus muscle here coming in and attaching into the supraglenoid tubercle. You can see the deltoid coming off the top, a bit of trapezius up here. And that's going to be your subscapularis because we are looking at this at a bit of an oblique angle um, and probably have a little bit of infraspinatus teres minor, probably teres major and latissimus dorsi in this um, neighborhood as well. And so as we go further back, yeah, that's where that's becoming the spine of the scapula. So you can see the body of the scapula, the spine of the scapula coming into the acromion process, the supraspinous fossa once again, where you're going to find the supraspinatus muscle, subscapularis, infraspinatus, 
And again, we're going to move out again to where that would come and the tendon would attach into um, the uh, head of the humerus into the supraglenoid tubercle. Quick view of the elbow here. So this would be the ulna out on this side. Here's your radius. There's your trochlea and the capitulum of the humerus. And I think that probably does it for the coronal view. And then one last view that we can get here is the sagittal view. So again, important to remember that we've got this mostly in the sagittal perspective, but there is a bit of an oblique angle. And so we see that the head of the humerus is sitting a little bit more anteriorly than what we would expect if the person uh, was completely straight without um, any sort of, uh, so they're, they're slightly protracted is what I'm trying to say in this position. So this would pretty much be a mid-sagittal view here. If we zoom in, we get a nice view of the uh, vertebrae in this perspective. You can see the vertebral canal, the spinal cord, that's pretty much the termination point there. Scroll back and forth, and you can see a little bit of the cauda equina moving up and down there. Um, zoom in on the vertebrae for a quick second. So this was an older individual, and we already saw that there was some pathology. And you can see some darkened areas, and uh, almost looks like vertical streaking within the vertebrae. And one of the earlier podcasts I did where I talked about the vertebral column, I said that's a sign of osteoporosis if you can see that streaking. You can see an intervertebral disc here nicely. A little bit of a nucleus propulsa would be in the middle here. Um, you can see some areas like the posterior contact, so not the uh, healthiest uh, situations by the looks of it. And particularly when we get into her cervical region, um, yeah, this is where you can see a fair bit of the pathology going through. And there's probably a couple of spots right there. It looks like we have a little bit of um, compression um, that's pushing in on the vertebral canal, so maybe a little bit of compromise to the um, spinal cord or the spinal nerves. So I wouldn't be surprised if she had some sort of neuropathy um, in her later years because of those um, what look like osteophytes or bone spurs sort of impeding on the vertebral canal. I think that shows up quite nicely in this situation. We can move a little bit more out to the side now. and. Again, right around the mid-region, get a nice view of the sternum here. There's the manubrium and the body. And if we go out to the side, we start to see the clavicle at the sternoclavicular joint. And then the clavicle migrates out. Nice view of the scapula here. So you can see the spine of the scapula. It's about to become the acromion process. Supraspinous fossa containing supraspinatus, infraspinous fossa over here containing the infraspinatus muscle, which shows up quite nicely. Teres minor is going to be down here. That's probably your teres major at this point. Here's your subscapularis muscle fitting in the subscapular fossa. And as we continue out a little bit further, yeah, you get a very nice view. There's the coracoid process anteriorly. And there's where the spine, so that would be the um, lateralmost portion of the spine. So if you remember, your, super, um, your suprascapular artery and nerve would be passing along here. So if uh, we had some contrast in those art that artery, we'd be able to see it sort of wrapping around here. And this takes us to where the head of the humerus is and the acromioclavicular joint. So I think we're on the left side where we saw that pathology, and this would be the subacromial tunnel yeah, right around this area here, and this would contain the tendon. So backing up a minute, keep your eye on where my cursor is here, because as we move forward, this would basically be your supraspinous um, or your supraspinatus tendon going out to the lateralmost section, and that's right around where it would attach. So let's zoom back out on this guy, or this uh, lady, and let's see if there's anything else I wanted to talk about real quick. Get into the hip region a little bit. 
let's just zoom in on the hip. Once again, we can see the head of the femur and the acetabular fossa, but not too much else to explain that we haven't already done in relation to that. So just finish up briefly with some uh, specific views at high quality images of the shoulder and knee. Uh, these are, I'm just going right directly to Radiopedia to be able to get. So if you see the address listed up there, um, that'll tell you where you can find these. I'm just scrolling through, nice view of the deltoid here. Um, looks like we're at the level, this should be anterior because it looks like we have subscapularis here and showing a little bit of the humeral head more of the humeral head in here. There we see the glenoid um, fossa. Notice a little divot on the side. So that is the uh, superglenoid tubercle. And so this dark material, it looks like um, the tendon or the cartilage. Yeah, this dark material over here would be the rim of the glenoid labrum. And then as we go further in, we can start to see the tendon for the supraspinatus muscle. So in this view, the tendon appears a little bit darker. And uh, what's interesting here is we have a little bit of a light band, so that's supposed to be a normal uh, MRI, but that might mean there's a little bit of um, deterioration here, which might be the reason that the gentleman was having the workup done in the first place. Here we see the spine of the, uh, sorry, the, uh, yeah, the spine of the scapula coming into the acromion. And looks like the acromioclavicular joint here with the clavicle, which we can then trace back slightly. So there's the clavicle moving back. So this is your subacromial tunnel, deltoid coming off of the acromion process, supraspinatus. And if we go further back in here, we're now behind the scapula, so that would be your infraspinatus muscle that we're now seeing here, and teres minor a bit further down. So let's take a moment here and just look at the um, um, same sort of idea here, just a slightly different um, uh, weighting density on those. Here's an axial view. And so as we move up and down, coracoid process there, glenoid fossa, articulating with the head of the rib, sorry, the head of the humerus. Oops. Uh, we move down and we can see more of the humeral head here, deltoid muscle, infraspinatus, subscapularis. So if we move back up, there's our supraspinatus there as we move superiorly, uh, coming across to attach into the supraglenoid tubercle, which would be out here. And then we could see infraspinatus also coming into that spot. Move to a sagittal view. So looks like we have the anterior section over here. So that should be our coracoid process moving into the glenoid fossa and then the head of the humerus showing up. This would be the spine of the scapula moving into where the clavicle is. So I don't think this is perfect uh, sagittal view, but that would be your acromioclavicular joint here where the acromion does meet the clavicle. So this would be the supraspinatus muscle once again. Infraspinatus on the posterior side, subscapularis muscle over here. So one last thing to look at, got a really nice um, MRI image of the knee here. So scroll down, we'll start at one specific end. So as we come through, you can see the head of the femur, quadriceps muscle, and be gastroc down there. And as we come in, I did not see a fibula, which means we must be on the medial aspect of the knee. Otherwise, I should have seen the head of the fibula there, which would mean this dark area here, that's going to be your medial meniscus. So cartilage uh, shows up black in this specific um, uh, 
aspect. And as we move through, so scrolling down, this is going into the middle of the knee. And as we move into the middle, you can see this dark mass coming off the back of the femur. Um, but from anteriorly. So that's coming off the anterior aspect and it's moving posteriorly and notice that it's attaching to the posterior aspect of the tibia. So that's going to be your posterior cruciate ligament. A little bit further down, we now start to see a ligament coming off the anterior aspect of the tibia and attaching to the posterior aspect of the femur. So that's going to be your anterior cruciate ligament in here. You can see the patella and the patellar tendon attaching in, patellar ligament coming further down. Uh, nice view of the hyaline cartilage lining the femur here. And as we move out laterally, starting to see the points of the lateral meniscus, which should start coming together as they do here. And we can also see that we're on the lateral aspect because we have the head of the fibula. Let's move this up a little bit. We got an axial view here. So we've got the head of the, f the condyles of the femur on either side, moving down in this case. And as we do, we can start to see the tibia. So this will be the tibial plateau should be able to see a little bit of the meniscus, not the best view of them. There we go. So this would be the, well, let's find out if we're medial or lateral here. So this is the head of the fibula, so we're lateral, which means that this is your lateral meniscus, and this would be the medial meniscus over on the other side. And you see a little bit of the ACL and PCL attached to the uh, uh, tibia. And as we move back up, we can see how they crisscross because they're the cruciates. And we can see the attachment of the PCL in here on the medial aspect on the ACL attaching into the lateral side. So that's a pretty cool view. Gastrocnemius once again, probably soleus and or plantaris. One last view here, we have a coronal view through the knee. And this is what we're going to finish up with. So we'll grab this and move this up and down. All right, so there's our head of the fibula, and there's our tibia. So this is the lateral side, lateral uh, condyle of the femur, medial condyle. So we should be seeing a little bit of the medial meniscus here. And as we go further, you can see when we're more in the midline how it's more further out to the side, that wedge there. That should be your lateral meniscus there. Posterior aspect of the leg here. So as we move forward, the ligament that attaches posteriorly on the tibia, that's actually your posterior cruciate ligament. So, and as we move forward, we can see how it comes up and attaches on the medial aspect of the tibia. And also, since we're further forward now, that shows where the tibia, sorry, the anterior cruciate ligament comes off of the tibia and then crosses back to attach to the lateral condyle of the femur. So just moving back and forth gives you a good perspective on how those two ligaments crisscross each other. And a little bit out to the side, you can also see the medial collateral ligament um, spanning that length and the lateral collateral ligament spanning the other length. So that'll do it. Um, I know this is a bit on the lengthy side, but hopefully you're just able to sit back and take it all in and uh, have a better perspective on how to read these radiological images. I um, also recommend you go to the review on Monday um, for radiology, or at least um, view it afterwards, because it will be recorded. And good luck studying, and good luck on Tuesday.